<laughs> Welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, we are coming live to you from Melbourne from the International Digital Curation Conference. And today's webinar is about library carpentry, starring Chris Erdman, who is Community and Development Director for Library Carpentry. And um, Chris, tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Oh yeah, so um, I uh, recently, I still feel like it was recent, uh, but I'm closing in on a year almost now of um, joining the Carpentries um, as uh, the Library Carpentry uh, Community and Development Director. Um, and uh, you know, I, work, I, I work with the Carpentries, but um, my project is funded through California Digital Library. Uh, so thanks to them and the IMLS, which is a grant agency in the, uh, in the United States. So um, thanks to them, um, able to um, help grow the community, the library carpentry community, and uh, get more people involved and uh, run more workshops and um, just help in general with uh, uh, skills training in libraries. So, Great. Yeah. Thank you. I should also say I, I'm Natasha Simons and I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons or ARDC and I'm the Associate Director for the Skilled Workforce Program and uh, Chris and I, speaking of workshops, are uh, running around the country next week uh, doing some workshops uh, on library carpentry and on developing your skills in the data area. Uh, so we have a workshop coming up in Perth on Monday and in Brisbane on Thursday and then um, in Sydney on next Friday. So if you haven't already heard about those workshops and you'd like to come, if you just go to ardc.edu.au and have a look under events, you'll be able to find that information and there's still time to register. They're free, so please come along if you can. It's about mapping your skills journey and learning a bit more about library carpentry and the carpentries in general. So I will now hand over to Chris to give the presentation. All right. It'll be a whistle-stop tour in, uh, in <laughs> Australia. So. Um, so yeah, today I'd like to um, talk to you a little bit about um, sort of the background of why um, why the carpentries and why library carpentry, why um, this is such an important time for us to um, you know train and uh, and carpentries being sort of a way to do that to um, you know really work with our researchers or um, automate things that we're doing in the libraries. Um, so I, I'd like to start um, just I already gave a little bit of introduction, um, but I can tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I spent about 10 years in astronomy, uh, so I worked really closely with uh, researchers for a while. Um, I worked in industry, um, so I worked with CNET, if uh, some of you might may have uh, heard it. Um, and uh, just recently, again, I joined the Carpentry, I joined California Digital Library. Um, and uh, so it's a little bit about myself, if, in case you're curious, that the picture of me is of the Von Trapp family um, library. So uh, <laughs> it's in Vermont or New Hampshire. I can't remember exactly, but uh, so um, so to frame this a little bit better. So uh, many of you probably are familiar with this, that um, sort of the skills and perspectives that um, we need uh, to work with data, you know, um, the really the things the, the increasing need that we have of working with data is something that has emerged over the years um, and has become more prevalent in, in many disciplines now. So you see a lot of people across the spectrum um, needing um, to, to learn more about like software and learn about um, how just better ways of working with data. And so we see this um, everywhere um, and uh, so I'm trying to move forward here. Let me try that. <laughs> <laughs> Clicking works too. So um, one of the examples I have here, um, and there's many examples of this, is that um, this comes from the National Science Foundation of a group of individuals have come together um, as part of a funded project to look at how um, universities, how um, academia can respond to this uh, growing demand. So how can they integrate this into um, their training, their curriculum, um, and this was a report um, that came out in 2016 of how they could sort of integrate this into the curriculum. And one of the things that I pulled out was this interesting um, uh, um, funded project called MSDSE. It was the Moore Sloan Data Science Environments. And what was interesting about that is that Moore, Moore and Sloan, Sloan uh, gave a bunch of money to certain schools, University of Washington, 
uh, Berkeley, Columbia, I believe, were three. There might have been a fourth, but um, they um, they were given this money to sort of um, catalyze uh, this multidisciplinary um, data science initiatives at their university to so bring people together around this idea of data science and skills training. And I included the link there. Um, it's a great report. One of the reasons why I also highlighted is that they, they say in this report that library spaces and librarians are critical um, to supporting this. Um, they were critical in the initiatives that um, I listed out. So, um, and then another report um, you see in, uh, in Europe, and, and it's not just Europe, but um, sometimes data science gets wrapped up in open science. And so in this report, they talk about skills and competencies um, more associated with uh, open science. But again, they're talking about data science and um, you know helping researchers become more efficient at their work and um, also librarians across the board. Um, and then um, another report is from industry. So um, this is one from uh, PwC, Pricewaterhouse uh, Cooper, on investing in America's data science and analytics talents, uh, the case for action. And this is a great report. It had um, academia, um, leaders from academia and leaders from um, industry talking about what they need. And um, businesses were saying, we need people with data skills. And um, colleges were saying, universities were saying, well, we're not there. We're not preparing people for for this. Um, and then um, <laughs> the arrow key now works. So, <laughs> um, and then uh, another report I saw recently from LinkedIn saying how many um, uh, employers are seeking people with data science, uh, data scientists, data savvy skills. Um, I recently um, visited a data science um, group at Advanced Auto Parts. And um, there, they were saying that they don't necessarily need data scientists. Um, they need data savvy workers. They need a team of people that are skilled to help um, with just, you know, all, all sorts of aspects of it. You know, like in particular with librarians, they were saying um, they have tr trouble tracking uh, the provenance of data and um, managing it. And uh, um, so th these are things that, um, you know, that that industry is also looking for. So um, here's a report that um, I used to follow this community newsletter, data science community newsletter, and uh, it slowed down. I think uh, the, the one of the primary people behind it, Laura Noren, has moved on to industry. But before she left, she was tracking all the data science initiatives across the US. And you can see this was like 70 and counting. It's much more now there, you know, it's growing. Um, a lot of universities in you know, academia is trying to uh, replicate what Berkeley and University of Washington did with the the, M, the more Sloan uh, data science initiative. Um, and another side of this too, is not just the data science part of it, but also that um, um, you see a lot of people in um, research not getting the, the background in developing software. So that really becomes like the backbone. Science is kind of glued together by all these scripts, all these, um, you know, all these, all the software sort of behind the scenes running things. And um, the people developing them don't get the training that they need. And so this is a um, report from the Software Sustainability Institute that sort of highlights the fact that people are not getting the training that they need to do proper software development in doing the research that they're doing. So, um, and we see examples, this is just one example of many of where um, mistakes can happen if you don't um, have proper workflows, if you don't have proper training. Um, and this led to this, um, Reinhardt and Rogoff ended up uh, influencing um, decisions, <laughs> administrative decisions, uh, that have repercussions. And so this is one of the things, reasons why we should care about this. Um, but I don't like to focus so much on the negative. I really like to focus on the positive of people that have come away and done training and um, improved the way that they work. And so this is a great paper called Our Path to Better Science in Less Time Using Open Science Tools. And this group, the Ocean Health Index, um, actually took um, carpentry's training and they um, they changed their workflows so they could actually respond to requests about 
can you give us the data that was associated with this paper or um, can you tell us why you know this program is operating in a certain way and so they they were able to really um, create a, um, a better workflow to to um, just keep track of everything and be better at what they do so it's a great paper I recommend uh, reading it um, later um, and then I mean not just from those stories but we have data telling us that um, researchers are asking for training and this one actually comes from Australia the bioinformatics community saying that they're looking for this kind of training this, this data science training um, and additionally we have a an NSF um, uh, report that also talks about sort of the unmet needs of um, of researchers and the, the training that they need and um, we did a similar when I was in astronomy we did a similar um, study and the same thing happened there with the same kind of results um, uh, so you can see this everywhere you go I think uh, it's common trend um, so how do we scale um, data and software skills, um, you know, we, we looked at those reports that were trying to integrate in curriculum and things are moving very slowly. Um, so um, one of the things is um, to train in the gaps, um, you know, to have this volunteer approach, this um, peer led hands on intensive workshops and um, open collaborative lessons. So like people all around the world can contribute to them and um, just a supportive community because learning this can be difficult. Um, and so here is the carpentries. <laughs> um, I think one of the more, more important things to say initially is that we are nonprofit um, and we're not for profit. And so sometimes I've heard that we are, um, but um, we really um, are a community led, a volunteer led community. So we try to keep our prices down to help the research community and libraries and IT um, with this training. Um, so another thing to point out here too is where does carpentry come from? And it's a, a you think of a tool belt and all the different tools that you have and uh, um, you know like working on something more applied and uh, that's where it comes from. But um, I think in general it's the approaches to be less more 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 like applied and the things you really need to know as opposed to if you went to a CES class and um, you learned more theory. These are the applied things that you really need to do to, to be better at working with data and software. Um, and so um, our workshops are two days active learning um, and um, they're taught by certified instructors. Um, and we have a training program for that. I'll talk a little, a little bit about it later. And we have feedback, active feedback. So um, you see these post-its sticking up in the class. So those are sort of signals to tell people that the instructors and the helpers in the class that I'm doing well or I need help. Um, and we also use that to write feedback at different points in, in the workshop. Um, so we could do this active feedback. Um, and I just realized I, ha I noticed a colleague in this picture <laughs> that I never I hadn't noticed before. But um, this uh, we have trained instructors. We have a friendly learning environment. One of the things that's core to our workshops is um, is our code of conduct and creating a welcoming um, environment. And um, you know we take that very seriously. And I think every every question you have is is a good question. And we uh, you know that from the very beginning we stress the code of conduct that we have so um the other questions that i get about um the carpentries and library carpentry software carpentry data carpentry is the you know the difference is sometimes people associate with one carpentry or the other um is sort of the history behind this is that we started with software carpentry and um, it grew into data carpentry and library carpentry and these are sort of different approaches so software carpentry was domain agnostic, it still is, and it, it covers her research workflows, software related workflows. Um, data carpentry is domain specific, so we have lessons on genomics and social sciences, and, and it's uh, more about the data um, and, and wrangling with that data and, uh, and visualizing it. And in library carpentry, it's about um, uh, workflows as well, um, um, about um, 
sort of getting onboarded and and uh, um, getting familiar with um, sort of these research work these these uh, research data lifecycle workflows, um, and it's about sort of also um, being able to connect with people, like so be able, being able to um, learn the language and being able to talk to people about um, you know this data science and um, data data science approaches. So. Um, Software Carpentry covers command line, version control, programming, um, data carpentry. Again, they, they, I mentioned some of the, the, um, the particular disciplines. So additionally, you can see at atmospheric science. Um, library Carpentry has a core lesson. Um, um, uh, so you can see data introduction, command line, version control, data wrangling. So this is what you get in a, in a, um, a standard uh, library carpentry workshop. Um, so um, you know our workshops really have this goal of um, teaching these skills. You know, really giving, getting, helping people get their feet wet, um, and in, and giving them that encouragement to continue learning and that positive learning experience. Again, I, you know, I mentioned that welcoming environment where people feel like they're welcome. You know, they they feel like they're encouraged to learn and um, don't feel like, um, you know, they, they don't feel left out and they feel like they're part of something. Um, so just to give you a sense of what, what, what this all encompasses, because it's hard to visualize, is that um, we have 76 member organizations. We have um, 1.6 uh, thousand, uh, you know, we have 1,600 trained instructors around the world, um, and we've run uh, 1,700 workshops. Um, this is all data from our recent annual report, um, 46 countries, 38,000 learners reached. That's a lot. Um, and seven continents, which is interesting. We actually did teach uh, a workshop in Antarctica, and there's a nature article about this. But um, I believe the researcher's flight was delayed, and so she decided to teach a workshop in Antarctica. So so we, we have covered all continents, uh, which is pretty impressive, too. Um, Another uh, great um, data point here is who takes these workshops. Um, so um, it, it's predominantly actually early career researchers um, that take this workshop and they come at it from different angles. So um, they either want to get that exposure, um, data science exposure, so they maybe they're ready to work in industry or they want to be more efficient um, and um, work in their, um, just improve the work in their labs. And so remember that Ocean Health Index, that was an example of like, these people are coming to, to learn how they can improve the work in their lab. Um, and it's about 66% of the data carpentry workshops that um, are early career. So this is from our um, uh, pre and post workshop surveys. Um, so, um, instructor, so how do you become an instructor? Um, we teach this edu education, this pedagogy, this teaching style, um, and it's through a two-day online um, course. And um, there are three other steps, so you have to demonstrate that you can edit a lesson through our GitHub repositories, lesson repositories. Um, and then a one-hour discussion of, like, what do I need to do before to pre pre prepare for my first workshop to teach? And, and then a demo of your teaching style. Um, it's a five minute demo. And so this is really what people go through to become a certified instructor. You don't learn how like a tool like R or a programming language like R, you don't learn a tool like Open or Fine. These are things you, 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 you have to go through the lessons and teach yourself. Um, but teaching someone else something you've learned is the greatest experience uh, um, of, of being able to teach yourself first and then teaching someone else. Um, and so um, I mentioned our lessons are open and collaboratively developed, um, and we have maintainers that manage these uh, um, uh, repositories. This one's interesting, the Open Refine one. You can see someone who's in Australia, actually, Carmi Cronier, who's at CSIRO, that actually um, submitted something to this, uh, to this repository. Um, Community, um, so um, we do a lot of other things in our community. Um, we have email lists and um, Slack and discussion lists, and I've been told this is actually one of our biggest assets that is not entirely clear from the outside. 
that you have this world of researchers and librarians and IT people at your fingertips that you can ask all sorts of questions and everyone is supportive. And it's just an amazing thing. And then we also help mentor people and do instructor onboarding and, um, of course, the teaching at other institutions. Uh, and here's some just some statements um, about uh, people's experiences. Um, help me reshape my work workflow into a far more efficient and ro robust process. So we've, you know, we've heard that um, from the Ocean Health Index as well. Um, another thing to sort of highlight here is the confidence level. Um, you can see from this, uh, you know, this visualization, um, what people take away from these workshops is post workshop survey data. And usually like one of the top things is they feel more confident, but they also pick up these other things. like know how to do reproducibility a little bit more. Um, I know coding better. So it's great. We see an impact. Um, and then back to this, um, idea that we are one carpentries. I think people, again, say software or data carpentry. We are all one carpentries. There are all these different paths you can take. So if you take library carpentry, it's very, um, I, I think it's incredible that our lessons are very um, similar to data carpentry lessons. I've taught genomics lessons that are very similar to library carpentry lessons. Um, and so it, it really is this path that you can take and say, I'm going to start with library carpentry, but I'm going to then I'm going to go to maybe teach atmospheric sciences, and maybe I'll come back to software carpentry because I I want to you know do like one that's um, a carpentry that's maybe for everyone. And um, so it's it's really all these different paths that uh, you can take advantage of all of our different lessons. And a lot of people here might be familiar with this uh, slide with the 23 research data things. Um, I equate uh, library carpentry similarly to the 23 research data things that um, really it's an onboarding. It's really a way for librarians to familiarize themselves with the research data lifecycle. Um, you know, I think these are very similar programs uh, um, that maybe the next step from 23 research data things was library carpentry. Um, and I like showing this uh, image because it shows that um, what library carpentry does is bring everyone on board. And that's what 23 research data things did is bring everyone to a point where everyone could have a conversation with each other. And the same is with library carpentry. Everyone can have uh, a conversation. You know, you can, you, it's, it's not one individual like a data librarian. We're talking about, we need everyone on board. We need a team approach um, to being more data savvy and, and, and really responding to the increasing data needs from our community. Um, and it's growing. Um, this is actually uh, an instructor training workshop um, that was hosted in uh, Portland a while back. But we've also since hosted another one in Calgary. Um, and we're hoping to host one in li at LIBOR in Europe. Um, so there's a lot of demand and interest in Europe right now for library carpentry. Um, this is a great example of the New England Software Carpentry Library Consortium, Nesquik, which sounds a lot like Nesquik. Um, and um, what this group did was amazing. The, the, you know, sometimes it becomes very bureaucratic and hard to make a case for membership in the carpentries, in library carpentry. And um, this group decided we're going to share the membership. We're going to um, split it out into different into different schools and one or two librarians will go on to do training and become instructors and we'll have a network and so they keep growing this network and more uh, universities are joining it and so what they're doing is actually creating that team across universities which is amazing and um, you know now they're talking about what next that they, that they can do and what other things that they can do to contribute to the community the National Library of Medicine um, is another example. They ran two workshops and they came out of those workshops saying, we want more. <laughs> we want um, SQL lessons. We want tidy data. Um, we want Python programming. And so this is something that started to begin now. People have done the library carpentry workshops and now they're interested in more. They want to do more with that style of, um, of you know, just carpentry -ness. <laughs> and another story I like to um, 
point to here is uh, written by a university librarian, actually, Elaine Westbrooks, who's near me in North Carolina. She's a university librarian at University of North Carolina, and she talks about um, library carpentry and the carpentries being the sort of strategic value that the library can be a hub for these kind of activities. So it's not just the librarians that are teaching, it's working with the researchers, um, becoming a member of the carpentries and teaching together and creating this rich network across campus that the library is the lead on, is the home for. Um, and uh, another example I like to um, um, cite here too is Fair Data and Software Carpentries Workshop, which was hosted in Germany um, over the summer. And it was a creative way to bring librarians and carpentries uh, researchers together around the carpentries training, but to integrate FAIR. And I think this is something amazing that we should start thinking about in libraries, where it allows us as librarians to bring in context and work with the researchers and really make rich connections um, around this sort of FAIR carpentries um, training. And it was amazing to hear them say, the researchers in attendance saying, I'm here for FAIR and carpentries. Um, and they're excited about both. And so I, I'd love to see this move forward. And we are trying to develop more FAIR-based material. And the next example is a <laughs> FAIR based, uh, we, thanks to ARDC and, and that spark from Natasha, actually, um, um, you know, we, we got the encouragement to do something that Library Carpentry has done before with sprints, but this time specifically for FAIR and to take something that ARDC has developed, this 20, 10 things, um, and, and turn it into a resource for FAIR. And so take that hacking approach and um, the community approach, developing material, open material on GitHub. And this went, this went really well. Um, you know, one of the things we've heard is that FAIR has been more gen generic and um, it's nice to have these examples at a disciplinary level, at a, at a more refined level. So you can go to that link, um, it just launched. Um, we're really proud of it. <laughs> Uh, and um, I'm just happy that uh, um, Natasha inspired it. It was a really great activity. Um, and then um, our lessons, you get an overview of our lessons. Um, I, you know, again, we teach data intro for librarians, Unix shell, open refine, Git, SQL for librarians, web scraping, tidy data, introduction to Python. But there's more, we're developing lessons like Wikidata or data privacy um, with Python or FAIR. Um, so there's a lot of, there's even a digital preservation one that was developed, being developed here at this very conference. Um, so there's a lot of activity now about that more part, um, which I find really exciting. Um, and a lot of times we get this question of like, how um, can I get started? Um, there's many ways. There's actually a get involved section of the library carpentry site, which is really helpful, but Really, you can host, you can register to um, re request a workshop, and you can host a workshop. Um, so instructors come in and teach a workshop, and you can get a, an idea of how they're run. You can help. Um, so if you have, you know, sort of skills with Open Refine, then you can say, I can be a helper and help helper and try and help the instructors in the workshop and go around and help people on their laptops. You can teach. You can become an instructor. So you can become, your organization can be a, uh, become a member or you can apply yourself and that application process is free. Um, so you can do it that way. Here's a little bit more information about the membership model. Um, Silver is really the, the way that people often um, go. Um, uh, it's what our most popular and that means six instructor seats um, and then some coordination going on for your workshops. Um, and just to close, um, uh, I'd like to close with a report that um, we ran. So this report was really inspired by a program called Data Scientist Training for Librarians um, that um, we started at Harvard. And uh, it was run at Copenhagen, actually, this picture is in Copenhagen. Um, and um, it, it really, um, again, was an approach of giving librarians a chance to um, experience um, this research data lifecycle and learn tools and learn approaches. And in this um, workshop, we heard time and time again that 
38 mentions of the carpentries as a way to move forward. And, um, you know, the data scientist training for librarians wasn't as scalable as, as the carpentries and as library carpentry. And so um, that's one of the, the, the great benefits of this network is that it's scalable. You can, you, you know, it's, you generally can get people in for two days to, to do training. And um, it builds up this sort of community. It, it, it has this credit, this uh, certification process where we can sort of trust that, uh, um, you know, we can trust that instructors will be teaching in the carpentry's pedagogy. Um, and so we can trust that we can do our assessments and provide you with all this data to tell you like what's happening, what, you know, what we are learning. So um, the other thing too, is that um, we talked about catalogs in that report um, and, uh, you know, all uh, many libraries have their own training programs and we're, they're very hard to find. And so um, one of the things we talked about was sort of a catalog to bring all these um, lesson materials together. But again, in the carpentries, we developed this open material and they're really these places where all that activity can come together and everyone sort of can work together to build a common resource. So there's sort of like some highlights from that report. I encourage you to read it some more. Um, it, it actually is more meant for administrators to understand the complexities involved in um, helping create a data savvy, um, you know, uh, library team. And so um, this is something you can maybe hand to your um, manager, or if you're a manager right now, you're reading it right now. <laughs> but it's for everyone, really. I think it's uh, it's got a lot of helpful information in there, and uh, even for also library schools of how um, they might approach um, integrating this training into the curriculum. So uh, that's it. Um, thank you for the time. This is how you can reach me. So Chris at carpentries.org or I'm libcce on Twitter, which uh, I've been told sounds a lot like a computer programming compiler. Uh, I, will not program, I will not compile code if you send uh, that to me in a tweet. But maybe someone will try it, actually. <laughs> but um, yeah, you can get a hold of me uh, those two ways. And thanks again. And uh, we can be ready for questions here. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. That was a really fantastic talk. Uh, one of the questions that people might ask is, uh, how can they find out what library carpentry courses are available to them here in Australia? And uh, you know what the Australian library carpentry community looks like? you have some information on that? Yeah, um, so um, in, uh, it's actually, Australia is one of our biggest, um, um, a lot of activity happens in, in, uh, in, in Australia around the carpentries and a lot of work has been done to grow it here. Um, so we do have a lot of instructors and, and uh, um, certified instructors. We even have programs that are thinking about um, trainers, having trainers. And so you see a lot of work um, so I know a group in at CSI row that has a lot of instructors, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of these organizations have, um, instructors I've heard at Macquarie, there was a big movement there. Um, and I think one thing is that we're, we're hoping for with library carpentry, we are hoping for more activity around library carpentry in, um, Australia. Um, so we have some library carpentry people here. Um, and they help with maintaining our lessons. Um, but with all this activity of developing more lessons and the interest in teaching, we really um, are hoping for more people to get involved. Um, so that's uh, that's one. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, uh, so there's a few people saying hi. <laughs> Greetings from Alice Springs. Hi, Ken. Thanks for joining us. I'm clean, keen to learn what opportunities there are to tap into data science learning training opportunities remotely. Yeah, and, and actually this has come up um, uh, sometimes in um, library carpentry of trying to do things more remotely. And, um, you know, it's part of our ethos to do things um, hands on um, um, because we feel like there's greater impact. <laughs> That is something that's just coming up and people are discussing. And I, I don't know how I can answer that, but in general, um, 
I know people try and do the MOOCs, the online training courses, and they stop. You know, they'll go through it and um, they won't have the same experience that they'll have online where you get to meet people and like form connections and, you know, be really part of that community part of, um, uh, you know, what the Carpentries brings. Um, so um, there's that. Um, uh, I, I know in the past I've actually picked up books and taught self-taught myself, um, which is also pretty difficult because you don't have the guidance, you know, like a program like the Carpentry, like, like Library Carpentry, sort of give you that um, initial guidance to help you with your f learning, your further learning. So um, I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, there's... Um, so you can't remotely tune into Library Carpentry at the moment. It's very much a face-to-face -face event, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, you can... Um, it, it's you can sort of lurk around in our um, in every workshop that we run. We use these things called Etherpads, and they're like Google, you know early versions of Google Docs, where people sort of will, will write out our um, our outline and all the things that we cover in the workshop. And you can go to the um, Etherpad and see what we cover and and sort of learn that way um, as well. If you can't attend in person, um, then you can see all that work that was done on the Etherpad. But our lessons are online, so you can walk through that. You know, if you walk through our lessons, um, that's what we teach. Right. Um, so. Can someone say, Ken in Alice Springs, can he actually request a library carpentry trainer to come out and just see who's available? Yeah, he can, and uh, we should share that link in here. Um, uh, but there's on the Library Carpentry website, there's a workshops um, section and, and there's a section on um, requesting a workshop. Okay. And um, that's where you can go in and request one. Um, the, the, the thing to note there is that when you request a standard workshop, um, we generally charge $2,500. Um, and that's American, so I don't know what that converts to exactly, but um, that's what we usually charge um, for um, the travel for instructors to come. So sometimes you can self-organize that to keep your costs down um, and, and sort of find instructors nearby. Um, and so we have maps, we have people you can reach out to where you can say, are there any people near, near me? And uh, actually a, a library in Singapore just did this um, where they said, can you help us find some maybe library carpentry instructors nearby? And um, I met, I um, connected them with some people actually in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and one of our instructors is very happy about that because <laughs> he's never been to uh, Singapore. Uh, but um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's one thing I can help you with if, you, if cost is an issue too. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay. As a question, you mentioned having taught a wide variation of domain-specific classes, such as genomics. What kind of domain-specific knowledge, aside, aside from the data skills, would you say you need to have in order to do this effectively? Yeah, and um, I, uh, so, um, I don't have any genomics background, um, but the way that I became familiar with the, the lesson material was that I started as a helper and um, learned in the course what the domain um, questions, the domain needs. Um, so I got a general sense of what they needed. I probably would need to do a little more, like um, do be a helper in, a, in another session just to get a little bit more background. But um, it, again, like you have that common um, technology thread that runs through it. And so the context side is something you pick up while you're, you know, you're helping with the lesson, and um, and it, you know, maybe as my next step, I wouldn't teach. It, it's generally not a good idea to teach a whole workshop. We usually have two instructors. Um, sometimes, um, so in, a, in a li other library carpentry lessons I've been at, we've had four people, three or four people, and so you can focus on a particular lesson, and so that allows you to step up and, you know, like pace yourself and become familiar with the content over time. Um, and um, that's how I, I, I've at least started with genomics. And uh, um, I, I, I find it really interesting to learn in the class, but also help with the technical challenges, which um, are pretty common, you know, throughout the lessons. Mm -hmm. um, so the same things that I was seeing in the genomics lesson are things that 
um, I saw in library carpentry lesson. So. Right. So I guess people might be a little bit frightened about the type of questions that they might get asked in a domain specific lesson that they might not know the answer to. Do you have a strategy for dealing with that? Is it sort of using some of the helpers in the room or? Well, yeah, again, if you start as a helper, you don't answer those questions. Right. That's the instructor. Okay. So you got to listen to hear what the, the instructor yeah. says. <laughs> um, but in your next iteration, if you decided to want, you know, to teach something, then you might pair with a researcher that has that domain background uh -huh. and and then ask them, you know, like, hey, and that's perfectly fine. In, in our workshops, instructors ask each other questions like, I don't really understand this. Can you? And that really helps actually in the environment because everyone's like, huh, my instructor doesn't know everything. <laughs> like they're also learning too at the same time. And so. Yeah. And that's very much a part of the carpentries, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Just yeah. Just everyone pitching in together to answer some of those tricky questions. And, Pretty much, yeah. 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 Um, in fact, we have this uh, session called Jargon Busting, which is really. Um, popular with people. I and love that session. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And everyone gets to chime in. It's not just the instructors. There are moments when the instructors are just sitting there like, what is that? <laughs> what have they put up on the board? I don't understand that term. And mm -hmm. someone in the room will know it and be able to describe it. And it, that just is a great moment to, sh to, to show everyone that, you know, it's not just one person that knows everything. We right. all know a little piece of the puzzle. puzzle. <laughs> yeah. So that jargon busting session is when you get to ask all your uh, questions that you've been too embarrassed to ask before a carpentry's lesson, like what is data wrangling? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and other things like that. And yeah, people put all kinds of stuff up there. What's an API? This is another basic one, or I don't know, anything you want to ask. I've got some really, really hard time. ones though. Yeah, what's a hard one? Oh, uh, um, I. I I, I feel like it was on the last session that I was in, and uh, um, it was it was a uh, it was about um, someone really kept asking me about S, uh, XML and XSLT, right? And uh, I hadn't worked in it, in it for so long, um, and uh, so I, I you know like that was pretty challenging, and I thankfully had someone to help me with that question. So yeah. okay, <laughs> cool, that's fun. <laughs> Uh, I'll just ask, by the way, I just, oh, yeah. if, if you are interested in um, becoming an instructor, um, one, of the, one of the things I'm really trying to do is, um, is help people here. And, you know, we, we definitely want to grow the community. And so if you really feel passionate and want to do this, um, and really the best way to learn is actually to teach this stuff, then um, really contact me and, uh, and we can find a way. Mm -hmm. I can, we'll, we'll find a way. Cool. If you're passionate enough, then we'll find a way, yeah. Um, Carmel Woods, hi Carmel, who's coming all the way from New Zealand, uh, is saying she's taught uh, software carpentry lessons via Skype within her organization, which is spread across 12 sites wow, in New Zealand. So that's pretty cool. Well, is we that, need to talk to you. Right. There you go. <laughs> Connection made. Carmel, Carmel I'm going to reach out to you. Yeah, like that would be great to learn from your experience, and it's possible. Uh, I, you know, it's definitely. It's It'd be nice great to hear. to hear about how that experience went because a lot of it is being in the room. So yeah, 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 yeah. It's to share the experiences, yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna be reaching out to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yep. Uh, uh, Ken is asking if the library carpentry lessons are on GitHub. They are. Yeah, and uh, anyone can contribute to them. You don't have to be, you know, an instructor. Um, Really, you can find anything that um, you have suggestion for and, and either um, create an issue or submit a pull request to, to make a change on the repository. So you need to know a bit about GitHub to be able to? Yeah, and um, uh, we can, I, again, we can help you with that. If you needed to help, you know, you could reach out. Um, in fact, we have this uh, wonderful place, um, this Gitter channel. Um, it's like a chat room. It's a Gitter lobby. For library carpentry and it's on our contact us page and um, you can ask those questions so we've gotten questions about hey I'm trying to organize a workshop and I don't understand how to set up the template um, so we have this template that we can use for every workshop that sort of streamlines everything mm -hmm. and um, we've gotten questions on there like I don't know what's happening I thought I did everything and um, and then you know we have questions about like in general about web scraping like I'm you know, 
trying to learn web scraping in general, what resources, you know, should we, uh, should I learn? And, uh, and then you can ask the question, like, how, how do I submit an issue? How do I submit? And there'll always be someone on there to help you. Um, right. So. And the address for the Gitta channel, is that on the Library Carpentry? Yeah, website? it's on our yeah. contact, uh, our connect link on libraryCarpentry.org. Okay, great. Um, can you please give the URL for the various carpentry lessons that we can walk through ourselves? So are they on the GitHub site? Or are they uh, the, probably the best way to um, view them sort of an overview is the libraryCarpentry.org and then forward slash lessons. Um, so that's how you get to our lessons and then you'll uh, see a listing of all of them and you can navigate to particular parts of that lesson. So, um, you know, the one that um, is a web page, a, a website um, of the lesson, then the repository that runs underneath it, you can see, um, you can see the maintainers, the names of people that are managing these um, um, repositories. You can have links to the guide, the instructor guide that's used. So uh, go to librarycarpentry.org and forward slash lessons, and that's um, where you can get a nice overview. Cool. And uh, I encourage you to look at the experimental, the con conceptual lessons at the moment. I might have missed some. I believe there's also a digital humanities one that's being thought of. So there, that that is an interesting area to see mm. what people are like working on. And those are sort of almost, some of them are almost to the point where they'll be um, released as alphas on our so you can see a little bit more of what's happening with the lesson but right now they're they're in that etherpad the experimental lessons etherpad of ideas that people mm -hmm. are working on so you'll be able to see how people contribute to developing library carpentry lessons which is pretty good yeah and the wikidata actually has an outline already um, okay so Great. hopefully they link to it <laughs> <laughs> good um so yeah just having a look at the other questions I think we've, oh, can you go into a bit more, sorry, from Ken again. Uh, can you go into, hi Ken. <laughs> can you go into a bit more detail about those levels of membership mentioned at the end of the presentation? Uh, mm -hmm. And is there a free tier or one price to suit individuals? So people are asking, do individuals join the Carpentries? Do organizations join? And what's, why would they do that? What's the pricing model? Um, well, I think, I think they're uh, the closest I've heard to um, that question is um, uh, thinking about um, memberships for like two or three people sometimes um, All right. to keep the cost manageable and so we do respond to those um, and if you go to the memberships page for Carpentries um, there's contact information where you can reach out and say like I'd like to explore this and um, we're generally receptive to that and trying to understand your scenario and uh, um, but we're also kind of rethinking our models. Um, these were sort of developed a while ago, and um, one of the new models that sort of threw threw us um, a sort of a new way, a new approach was the Nest Click um, uh, model that I um, I mentioned earlier, which was a consortium. Um, and in libraries, we have many consortiums, <laughs> so um, that's um, that's another way to think about it, is going to your consortium and thinking like, how could we do this together? Um, you know, as a community and a consortium. Um, and then there's the application process. If you wanted to do it individually, um, you can apply to become an instructor. Um, there's, a, 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 trying to remember exactly, I believe it's the teach option under carpentries.org um, that has an option where you can sort of apply to become an instructor. And um, that's where you can do it individually. Um, and, um, you, that's free, um, but there's a queue. There's, this is really popular, so it's a queue. It might take you a while, and that's what the benefits of membership give you is that you're able to jump ahead of that queue and take the training, um, you know, earlier, right away, um, as a cohort too. Um, but the application process, we have a criteria for that, and one of the ways um, we sort of, um, you know, look at applications is. Um, to build that so a more um, diverse and inclusive community as well. So um, that's one of the things we look for too is, um, you know, helping to build the diversity in our community. Um, but it, it may take some time. Um, sometimes I know lately we've been doing a better job of getting through um, 
the applications uh, faster and uh, getting to people. And so um, just be patient <laughs> if you want to go that route or um, convince your manager, or convince your consortium. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. That brings us to the end of the questions. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Have you got any last words, Chris? No, I just want to say thanks for um, tuning in. Um, uh, we had a really great turnout. It's great to see there, that there's a lot of interest. And again, just reach out to me if you're, you really want to get involved and, and you're passionate about this stuff. We'll make it, we'll make it happen. And I know um, we're also thinking about this on, right. on my trip of how we can help people. And uh, so... Um, on the on this tour, it's all about helping. So, yeah. <laughs> fantastic! Uh, thanks very much for coming.